I just wanted to share with you that uh, I'm finding it really hot. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Canada, and when I left, uh, it was minus 18. And I missed minus 34. So I left on Thursday, and Friday it was supposed to be minus 34. So it's a little warm. Um, I'm going to be talking about third-party testing with OpenStack. And let's find out, first of all, who the heck am I? Um, my name is Anita Kuno, and my nick is Antea. So that's on Twitter and IRC and any place else where you need a nick. Um, my email, if you need to email me. Uh, I work with HP, and I work upstream with OpenStack. So um, we are talking about uh, third-party testing with OpenStack. And what, what does that mean? Does anybody have a sense of, of what I mean with third-party testing? Great. OK, all the OpenStack folks know. <laughs> Let's include the rest of you. Um, so right now with, with OpenStack, we have our uh, testing infrastructure, which tests all of our patches um, when they're pushed up to Garrett and also prior to merging. And Jim talked about that this morning. And so we have a certain set of tests that we test. We have um, our uh, we have unit tests, uh, integration tests, which is our, our Tempest test suite, and that's uh, API testing, uh, as well as uh, various other tests. Um, we test uh, using CentOS for Python 2.6, and we test using Ubuntu uh, with all the rest of our tests that that need. Um, uh, like Python 2.7 and, and Python 3.3 uh, uses Ubuntu. So if somebody needed uh, an operating system or needed to test OpenStack on a different operating system, um, we don't have that with our current testing structure. So that is a potential candidate for third-party testing uh, because if somebody wanted to run tests on the OpenStack code with that particular setup, uh, we don't have that internally. Um, but people are welcome to do that. So third-party testing is a way of hooking in to um, our event stream so that you can uh, run your own tests with whatever configuration that you want. So we're going to start off by taking a look at the current OpenStack testing infrastructure. And I created a blindingly brilliant slide, so shield your eyes. <laughs> Colorful, isn't it? Okay, so we're going to start. We're going to start uh, in the lower corner here with you, and you are the red oval. So there you are working on your own local environment, and you're doing magical things. And all of a sudden, you have a piece of code that you would like to share with everybody else. And of course, you have run your own tests locally before you do so. And then you uh, submit that patch to Garrett. And Garrett essentially, does everybody know what Garrett is? Great, OK. So Garrett essentially, think of Garrett as a Git repo with a little bit more upfront than a normal Git repo. So a normal Git repo, you can push and merge and do all of the other lovely Git commands. And Garrett is a repo with a very specific front end that gives you permissions about what you can offer to Garrett. And the way that our workflow works best is with a tool called Git Review. And what you do is you submit uh, a patch to Garrett, and, and Garrett then becomes aware of it. And there are certain things that then can happen with that patch. And if everything goes well, then that patch can be merged into the master branch. Does that make sense? Wonderful. OK. So Garrett is a fancy Git repo. There is an event stream that Garrett emits that other things can know about. In our internal system, the thing that listens to that Garrett event stream is Zool. So Zool is the big green box at the top. And Zool uh, does many lovely things. 
Uh, but one of the things that it does is that it listens to the Garrett event stream and it takes action based upon the kind of message that it gets. So we're going to uh, take a look at the patch set created message. And if a patch set is created, uh, then it goes up to Zool. Zool has a little communication with Gearman. Gearman and Gearman workers are an intermediate layer that we needed to put in place because we have three Jenkinses. For a long time, we had one, one Garrett and one Jenkins, and life was lovely. And what we found is that a Jenkins can only deal with about 185 jobs or VMs running at the same time, and once it goes beyond 185, bad things happen. And we were at a point where we had to be able to have more than 185 VMs running all at the same time. So we had to scale out our Jenkinses. And the way we did that is by using Gearman. So Zool talks to Gearman, and Gearman then talks to its Gearman workers. And so everything under a Jenkins is a Gearman worker. And I didn't have enough time, space to put worker beside. So everything under a Jenkins is a Gearman worker. And the Gearman worker talks to the Jenkins. Now, you'll see at the bottom a lovely thing called node pool. And Jim talked about node pool this morning as well. And node, pool, node pool's job is to be aware of all of the dependencies for a current build of DevStack. And DevStack is our OpenStack development and testing tool. So uh, I believe it's once every 24 hours. Uh, Node pool will load up all the dependencies for a dev stack, make an image, and then use that image to generate VMs. So all of the stars are VMs. So node pool is making VMs, and each VM is associated with a Jenkins. So there's some stars, the ones here without a red circle, they are VMs held in reserve. And when Jenkins, when the message comes through and Jenkins actually has a job to run because a new patch set has been created, so Jenkins has stuff to do now, it will go down to in, into its reserve of VMs and it will grab one of them and it will start running jobs on it. And then once the jobs are finished, then that VM comes down and NodePool is keeping track of how many there are and it's building more up. And so uh, each of those spaces then is just indicating that the VMs are associated with a Jenkins. Once a job is finished running, the logs are, I won't go into all of the things that happen with the logs, but uh, the URLs, the logs are on a server and then the URLs for the logs are taken and a message is passed all the way back through everybody to Zool and a, a comment is written on the patch with URLs to those logs. So for every test that was, with, that was run, there is a log and a URL to that set of logs. Have I, do, is everybody still with me? Nodding heads, good sign, thank you. Okay, so this is how our infrastructure testing works. This, everything that we run, runs on a VM. We don't do any hardware. We don't have any tests running on hardware. And like I said, we have, we have two operating systems that we use for our tests, and that's CentOS for Python 2.6 and Ubuntu for everything else. And we also have one setup per node. So if somebody needs to do multi-node testing, as some of the other talks were talking about earlier, if somebody needs to do multi-node multi testing, Multi-node testing, our current setup doesn't support that. We do recognize the need for that, and there's the discussion happening about what to do, but right here, right now, we don't have support for that, and we don't have support for specific hardware configurations. So that's now. And also, um, we need to find out what tests are being run in OpenStack. So the way to find out what tests are being run in OpenStack is we have to take a look at the OpenStack test running code. And 
I made this slide because I find it very, very difficult to navigate this particular repo. And the particular repo that I'm talking about, if you look at the second oval down, it's the OpenStack infra config repo. The config repo is huge. It is the Bermuda Triangle of OpenStack infrastructure. Everything goes in there, and God help you if anything comes out. <laughs> And it really helps to have a sense of where to go looking for stuff. Now, the reason it's so big is because it runs everything. Our entire OpenStack infrastructure is dealt with by this particular repo. So it's big for a reason, but that doesn't make it any more manageable when people want to run third-party tests or evaluate whether or not they should be running third-party tests. I'll also point out I made a mistake on this slide. And I'll tell you the mistake in a minute. So if you want to evaluate whether or not your particular configuration is currently running in OpenStack, the first thing you have to do is take a look at what tests and what jobs there are that are being run or that are available to be run. And so you start with git.openstack.org, which is where all of the OpenStack repositories are found. And then you go into the OpenStack Infra config repository. Then modules, and here's where I made the mistake. We're going to start by, by taking a look at, we're going to go to projects, Python, jobs, and macros, which are three YAML files amongst many, which are found in the OpenStack project module and files. <coughs> and then there's uh, a directory, uh, a, a subdirectory, Jenkins job builder. Config is the only directory inside of there, and then there's a number of YAML files. So go there and start wandering around in there in terms of looking at what jobs are being run and what jobs are available to be run. Then if you want to see what the scripts are that actually run the jobs, go back up to modules, and instead of OpenStack project, you need to go into Jenkins, and then files, and then slave scripts and run docs. And this particular example took a look at uh, running a docs job on, on a particular repo. Jim. Sorry to interrupt. Please. I think the reason why you, you made that mistake on that slide is because that's actually what it should be. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Not only is it a, a large repository, it's an old one, and occasionally it has artifacts of uh, before we had figured out a lot of the organization. So okay. All of those really should be um, files that are associated with the way the OpenStack project operates. So that's where the do belong. The ones that are in, in the Jenkins module are, are there erroneously. Ah, okay. So if anybody's listening and really wants to offer a patch, <laughs> that sounds like an opportunity there. But, but the, the point for the slide is that, that there are a whole lot of tests that we do run. So if you're evaluating whether or not you want to be running third-party tests, here is a place to start to find out what we are running. And if what, we, what you're looking for isn't there, then you have two options. One is offer us a patch to put your, um, your job in Jenkins. And the second one is go the other route and, and create some third-party tests. Did I see a question up here? Stretching? OK. Um, why would you want to run third-party tests? One is if you're ahead of the curve. Our first um, uh, uh, third-party test uh, grouping, uh, which was Smokestack, um, actually started before our, we were fully testing all of OpenStack. And, and this particular developer, um, being the go-getter that he is, uh, decided that he wanted to see some tests run. And so he created his own uh, application for that and his own set of tests. And he uh, listened to, to the Garrett stream. And he, uh, he created that himself. So that's Smokestack. Um, what uh, run, if you're if you want to run tests that OpenStack doesn't, 
and we just went over how to evaluate whether, whether or not OpenStack is running the tests that you want, or if you're testing proprietary code or hardware. We have a number of examples um, where people have uh, code that they can't make available for legal reasons uh, or hardware uh, uh, that is not available to us uh, that they want to evaluate. So those are, those are some candidate, candidates for third-party testing. Um, so the way that you uh, hook in uh, is by using the Garrett stream. Uh, so you do so by listening to Garrett. And the command is Garrett stream events. Not very hard. Where does that run? Uh, you can run it from the command line. Uh, I'll get to the full command in just a minute. What, what machine? I'm sorry, what machine? I can run it locally on my machine. You can, yes, sorry. Yes, so you need a Garrett account. And uh, the Garrett account has to have your uh, SSH public key. So um, if John wants to, to listen to stream events, which he does, uh, we'll get there. Um, and so uh, what he has to do is he has to make sure he has a Garrett account, which John does, uh, with an SSH public key, which it does uh, because I've seen a John push patches. Uh, and so if you want to follow this command, John, tell us how you do. Uh, so SSH, and the port is 29418. You use your Garrett username at host, and in this example, host is review.openstack.org, white space Garrett, white space stream events. Let's see how John does. And then once, <laughs> once you run the command, Garrett actually has to be doing something. And we've already established that the majority of people in, in Europe and North America are currently asleep. So something happened. Something happened. <laughs> what happened, John? A recheck, no bug. Yay. OK. <laughs> Boo. Boo. <laughs> Yay for we have an event. Boo that it's recheck, no bug. And we will, we will get to recheck, no bug, uh, but I need to hurry along. Uh, sorry, I'm taking too long. So the message types that are available when you're listening to the stream event, patch set created, comment added, change merged, and change abandoned. Patch set created when you're initially setting up your third party test is what you're going to be listening to. Comment added is uh, where recheck no bug came from. It was a comment added type. Um, so that's, that's something that we're in discussion now about whether or not somebody who adds a third party test should be paying attention to a comment added. So you want to trigger off of patch set created. And so what you do is you listen to the stream. You get, it's a, it's JSON output um, when you have an event. And then you take that and you do what you're going to do with your tests. And then you can post to Garrett. Um, and posting is git review and the SHA of the commit, the first, I think it's first six or eight uh, characters of the git SHA uh, for that particular um, patch. Um, the uh, Garrett will only show you or show the account um, the events that are associated with the ACLs for that project, uh, for that account. So an ACL is access control, and Garrett has different ways of identifying what group you're in. Go ahead, John. So my next question is about what user is running these tests. So I want to set up a third-party test to do some extra testing. Yep. Do I have to run that as me for the particular permissions, or can, is it possible for me to set up a test user within, inside of the Garrett infrastructure? You can set up a test user, and, and we will get to that. But you can set up a test user, and then you would take a look at the ACLs for the project and find out what permissions that, that user account or that test account has to have in order for you to do what you need to do. And then you submit a patch giving that uh, or, or um, ask for an account with that and make sure everybody in infra is okay with that uh, and, and permissions and so on and then you can just merrily go ahead and do your thing. Fair enough? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so if you want to take a look at the access level controls for projects, there is the URL. 
long and ugly. I couldn't figure out a way to make it pretty on the slide, so I apologize, but there's all the information. Um, so it's the git.openstack.org, and then it's in config, so you're going to need the path. Uh, take the path in, and then there's, I think, uh, three or four directories and, and a file um, in order to, to see what all the uh, um, access level controls are for the various projects. So the ACL for Neutron looks like this. So um, in order to have access to refs heads, um, you need to be Neutron Core. So any Joe Schmo uh, doesn't have access uh, to those. Uh, milestone proposed, you have to be in the Neutron Milestone group. So that's, that is a separate group from Neutron Core, which I believe is all of Neutron Core, yes? We don't know, we don't know. Anyway, okay, they're two separate groups. Okay, all right, so, so they are separate groups uh, to have access to, to two different branches, the two different sets of refs. Um, require change ID true, uh, so git review as a tool automatically um, uh, creates a, a new change ID for every patch, uh, and so that's required um, by, by the project, and we require a contributor agreement. Um, so in terms of what to post when you have uh, listened and you're, you've run your tests and you're ready to start sharing all this lovely information that you have from the tests that you've run, uh, start with a message uh, and that's an M flag with build successful in the Git SHA. And you'll notice that there's two levels of quoting, one for the shell and one for the Garrett parser. So build successful is the message and it's got double quotes around it. Uh, some output logs, so there's a message, git review with the M flag and there's the message and the message includes a URL uh, for some git logs, or from test, uh, sorry, some test logs. Um, and we would prefer that the test logs have a stable URL because the stable URL really helps when we're going back three months, six months after the tests have run, and to see what's happening with that patch or if things have changed. Um, also ensure your testing structure is stable prior to, acti to activating verification. Verification is, is voting. Um, you have the opportunity to give a patch a plus one, minus one um, as a result at, by, by being able to send that message. Um, and if you're going to activate voting, please make sure that your testing structure is stable. We're having some difficulty right now uh, with people who are keen to get their third-party testing active and they're shoving everything into the message. And unfortunately, we're getting some minus one verifications because their testing structure has fallen over. So that affects uh, our process for development. Um, so there's what the message looks like if you do verified. So verified is minus one uh, and the git shaw. So altogether, that's what the whole message looks like. Okay, so if you, if you want to do this, you have to create a service account. You send an email to openstack-infra at lists.openstack.org. And some of the people sitting down here will read your email uh, hopefully, when you send the initial email along the lines of please provide me a service account, um, you give an SSH key, the public SSH key obviously, for the account, uh, a short unique username uh, that it will be used in Garrett, and a testing structure display name, which hopefully is not an acronym and something that actually is something that people can find, so it's useful, uh, as well as an email contact. Uh, and please be prepared to uh, monitor that email and respond to any email inquiries about your testing system. Uh, respond to an email asking for clarification because sometimes we need to tweak that before we can uh, give you a third party testing account. Is this too small? This is a screenshot, so unfortunately I can't make it bigger. I'm, I'm sensing it's a little small, sorry. Okay, basically this is, this is the current list of people who have been granted, <laughs> little, little old is it? Needs some culling? Okay. 
Oh, okay. We're, we're, we're growing. We're growing. Uh, this, um, we can get this list if you go to review.openstack.org and sign in. Go to admin groups and ex external testing tools, and that's the current list of who has been granted uh, an account. Um, in terms of actually running the tests, you have some options. You can use Jenkins with a Garrett plugin. So if you just want to get to running the tests and you don't have to, a lot of time to spend setting up the system, uh, you can stand up your own Jenkins. You can uh, activate a Garrett plugin uh, and just give uh, Garrett the, the information that it needs uh, to listen to uh, the Garrett stream that we produce. And, and then you can start um, running the tests and, and sharing your feedback. The point of the exercise is that you are running your tests and you're sharing your feedback with the community. This patch will break what I've got going on here. This patch will work well with what I've got going on here. So in your logs, be detailed about what you're testing and, and what those logs, uh, the information the logs are providing because hopefully uh, the person writing the patch will take enough interest that they will change the patch so that, that what you are doing and what they're doing work well together. That's the hope. Uh, you can also use Jenkins and Zool. Uh, all of our infrastructure is open source. You can take any of it or any part of it, and you can stand it up yourself. So you can take Zool, you can take NodePool, uh, you can take the Jenkins configuration that we have, and you can do the whole thing or part of it uh, and use that yourself. Smokestack like I said, is one application that already is doing third-party testing and is the oldest example of third-party testing. Um, Dan Prince is the person who wrote it. Uh, he wrote it in Ruby uh, because that's where he was comfortable. Um, he uses uh, an application called Bellows, and that's the Garrett trigger, so it listens to Garrett. And the uh, URL is um, HTTPS smokestack.openstack.org. Be aware that currently he's using an unsigned cert uh, for that. I know, what a shock. I talked to him, but that's what he wanted to do. So anyway, so be prepared. Uh, you will be asked to, to okay an exception for this in order to get into it. Um, so at this, uh, uh, at this URL, and something that's really nice is that he created a whole app for this so that you can go and you can see what tests have run with Smokestack. So you can go in and, and look at all of them. Um, in terms of, we'll just go back to, we'll stay on Smokestack for just a second. Um, what, does, what does Smokestack run? Uh, it started off running, you told me lunchtime and I blanked. Zen server, thank you, yes. It's very hard to test in, um, in uh, public clouds, at least that are under user. Uh, so so it's, uh, it was an early form of testing with OpenStack on real hardware. OK. So uh, the, the response that, that Jim gave me was uh, it was testing Zen server, because Zen server is difficult to test on public clouds. So uh, he was testing Zen server on real hardware and then bringing back the results um, of, of those tests for people to, to uh, the messages were, were happening on the patches themselves, uh, and also people could go to smokestack.openstack.org and, and look at all of, of the logs. Um, and currently he is testing, I think he's testing RPM package builds? Yes? Okay. So Dan, Dan tests what Dan needs to test. And it's fortunate that he's got this lovely setup because he has that flexibility. And he's also very, very good at sharing information and being available to answer questions uh, so that if people want to use the information he's providing, he can, can work with them uh, to make that useful. The other example uh, is Turbo Hipster. Thank you, Joshua. How, how old is Turbo Hipster? Uh, since it was turned on voting or since I started voting? Um, well, let's go with how, since it was turned on voting. Okay, all right, so a couple weeks, uh, Turbo Hipster's been voting. And how long since you've been working on tur Turbo Hipster? Oh, it's not an accurate indication of how hard it was because I was doing other stuff as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, since uh, late July. Okay. So 
So, so Turbo Hipster is recent. Uh, and um, one of the things that I really have to credit both you and Michael for being amazing with Turbo Hipster is the level of detail and information that you're willing to provide to people. Your logs are terrific, and we'll, we'll look at that. All right, I'm out of time. Am I out of time? Oh God, okay, well, sorry. Um, and I was afraid I was gonna go short. Um, uh, but but I, I, I will compliment you on that, as well as being uh, very, very available. Uh, if you take a look at, um, I think it's just this month, if you take a look at the developer archives for OpenStack uh, for the email list, uh, there was a question about uh, Turbo Hipster, um, there was a, a problem uh, and, and voting and verification with Turbo Hipster, and the response that, that Michael gave and the level of detail in that um, was very, very good uh, in terms of being very helpful uh, for the developer who asked the question so that they could then consume that information and then make the decisions they needed to do. So obviously I'm in wrap up mode now. Sorry about that. Uh, so if anybody wants to take a look at the code for Turbo Hipster, uh, there's a URL for browsing. I highly recommend it. The other thing that I want to talk about with, with Turbo Hipster just before we, we move off of it um, is that Turbo Hipster started as a project to enable you at Rackspace to test migrations in Nova Master to make sure two things, that the migration would work with real data and that the migration would complete within a certain time frame. Yes? Okay. And what's happened is that that particular functionality is now a plugin for Turbo Hipster. So Turbo Hipster was written for that, for that functionality but Turbo Hipster is essentially, if you go back to the slide that I, that I showed before with Gearman and the Gearman workers, uh, Turbo Hipster is written to do the work of a Gearman worker and to communicate directly with Zool if we think of Zool as a Gearman server or a Gearman master. I got that right? Okay. So what that does then is if you want to take Turbo Hipster and use that, with Zool, so you have to have your own Zool, and Turbo Hipster, then you can write a plugin to do the functionality to run the tests that you want to run, um, but it saves you the time of having to write all of the configuration scripts and get everything standing up and so on to have things actually working. Um, I'm actually going to have to end there, um, and I thank you very much for your time. Uh, does anybody have any quick questions before I vacate getting ready for the next speaker? John. What happens when the remote testing is unavailable for some reason? I mean, Can you give me an example? The, the remote server testing isn't receiving events or things like that. Is it, I mean, what's the failover condition on relying on those third party things? Oh, okay, so in terms of reliance, um, the, the patch whether it, whether it votes plus one or minus one or doesn't vote anything at all, Garrett and the review structure is perfectly capable of going forward processing that patch uh, and being able to merge that if all of the rest of, of the, the testing infrastructure runs. So there is no dependence on a third party test whether it is there or not. The only thing would be a verbal thing if for my repo and you and I have an agreement that you say you really want to make sure that my repo works with your thing and I agree and say yes, I want to make sure that my repo works with your thing, then what I would do is physically uh, I would just not approve a patch until I heard from your, your testing structure. Pardon me? That's just a social thing. That's, that, that would be a social thing. That would be a social thing. Yes. Michael? One of the other things that I believe Dan Prince does is that he has Smokestack reports to the Smokestack site, but nothing 
nothing gets sent as a message to uh, Garrett, OpenStack's Garrett, until he physically goes in and says, okay, send the message, send the message. So if, the, if, if something happens with his own structure that it falls over and disappears, then uh, he doesn't have a whole bunch of minus ones that do to his structure falling over. Did that answer your question or no? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>